Well, good morning. I'll tell you, it's uh, great to be here. I'm going to take full credit for the warm weather moving this way and uh, spring showing up. Uh, brought it in from Hawaii for you. You can thank me later. I know it's been kind of a rough winter, uh, so uh, uh, it's great to see. I'm particularly excited. A lot of friends here, folks I've uh, served with, gosh, nearly 40 years. And it's really encouraging the front row, these old retired folks who look very rested. At first, when I saw Halvey and, and Pat and JD, and I thought, hey, wait a minute, these are some new recruits, man. We'll get them for 35 years, you know. We're, so uh, it was really great to see. Now, I do, uh, I want to tell you, I had trouble sleeping last night, not because of the six-hour time difference, but I was a little bit guilty, and I've got to confess to you here. Uh, maybe back in my youth, when I had a full head of hair and it was brown, uh, not gray like it is now, and barely any left, I might have made fun of air defenders in my youth. And, uh, you know, I had a couple friends, a couple good friends. You know, Marty Coyne, a famous air defender, and Matt Brown, former teammates of mine there at uh, West Point stuff. But I remember calling them duck hunters. And then I do also remember, uh, you know, I said, you guys are really obsolete. I mean, come on. You know, there's a, we haven't had a soldier killed by enemy air since 1953. Uh, we have total domination in the air. And and of course, as you get older and wiser and I have very little hair left, I realize, boy, does your perspective change and I couldn't have been more wrong. So I want to apologize for that, kind of confess up front to all the air defenders. And, uh, and I would say now uh, I'm your biggest fan. Uh, being a uh, theater uh, army commander, I can tell you, especially Indo-Pacific theater, holy smokes, if you want to talk about the heroes out there, I'll uh, bring up just incredible the, the work being done by our great air defenders out there. And, and so uh, I've, I've, I've gotten a lot smarter, wiser, and I'll talk about that here. So I want to hit a couple things. Uh, mainly, you know, this changing character of war. And nowhere is it more apparent than in the Indo-Pacific, the vast region. You know, Indo-PACOM is 52% of the Earth's surface and uh, 36 nations, and, and it is uh, the, the fastest-growing region. Uh, some people, uh, it's interesting, you know, there's uh, seven of the ten largest armies in the world. Uh, you look in uh, Indo-PACOM, you see a lot of blue, but uh, as uh, Ben Hodges said, once people live on the land and, uh, and conflict uh, uh, does occur uh, most often on the land. And I would, say, I would never say it's a land theater, though. I wouldn't say it's maritime theater. It's a joint theater, uh, more joint than anywhere. And when you look, uh, this changing character of war has a huge impact on it. And I want to talk a little bit about integrated air and missile defense and uh, what we're doing out there, what we have now, and then the direction we're moving, uh, as Jim mentioned, with uh, multi-domain operations. Very excited. We've been, we're in our second, uh, well, actually starting our third year of this uh, pilot for the Army of, of what multi-domain operations in effect, uh, what it looks like. And I will tell you, it's, uh, it's extremely promising, and we're moving very quickly from uh, uh, concept to doctrine uh, faster than ever before in history, spinning right into doctrine, and we have to because of the speed of uh, human velocity and how quick things are moving out there today. Uh, we have no choice. And then uh, just talk a little bit uh, more about uh, the role of uh, integrated air and missile defense and space, uh, which is something I never thought I would say, being an infantryman, but the key role of space, as Jim mentioned, uh, in this, pulling it all together in multi-domain operations in the future. So first, uh, a quick look at the competitive environment. I always enjoy this picture. When, and, uh, you know, I always, uh, the, the question always comes up, I wonder what they're toasting. I'm pretty sure they're toasting, uh, messing with us, uh, both of them. And uh, competitors, as it says in National Defense Strategy, and I, of course, competition does not mean conflict. You'd have to be crazy to want conflict. But I can tell you, it is a hyper-competition. It is absolutely unbelievable. There is, uh, when you uh, are not in an area for a, a certain amount of time, or you pull out, say, for example, when we, uh, Thailand had a coup and we pulled out for a while a few years ago, uh, within seconds, that void is filled, and it is an incredible competition. And you look at, for China, the One Belt, One Road, 50-year uh, strategy there, uh, where they are uh, really... Uh, posturing themselves uh, for, for the future. So this hyper-competition, I would say there, you know, there is no longer a phase zero. I never liked that term anyway and implied nothing was happening. 
However, there were, you know, there were uh, times uh, in the phase zero in the past where there wasn't a ton going. There's always something happening, but not like today. There's absolutely no phase zero. It is a hyper competition constantly and nowhere more than in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, I think it's really key you look at, because of that hyper competition, you have to have an incredible presence and posture. You have to be able to compete. Uh, again, don't want conflict, but if you're not competing, uh, those that are, that are out there competing, they, they are uh, emboldened in their aggressiveness. And so if you're not out there in the competition phase, uh, good luck. You're going to have some real challenges. And the good news is, uh, as we look, you know, land uh, gives you incredible persistence. Uh, as we all know, it shows a commitment like nothing else and a survivability that's been coming up. And I'll talk more about that later. So let me jump into the integrated air and missile defense uh, out in the Pacific, and I would tell you, uh, to say it has changed from when I was younger and making fun of air defenders is like the understatement of the century. Uh, and you look at uh, the first couple years uh, I was uh, in command, and uh, Korea kept our attention, North Korea kept our attention pretty significantly. And in fact, uh, I would tell you it's absolutely, thank goodness, we have amazing soldiers out there with THAAD, as we put that uh, on the peninsula and that in Guam uh, and Patriot uh, around the region, absolutely unbelievable. And you go visit these young men and women, and I got to tell you, it makes you feel great about being an American. It makes you feel great about being Army because you know, you're in there with a young 20-year-old uh, and he's showing you this radar system and, and showing you a launch that occurred earlier. And I've actually been in the uh, Air Operations Center at Hickam, which is, there's no more joint place. You'll see all services in there, but a lot of Army. Uh, and I've uh, been in there with the uh, former Secretary of the Army when a launch has occurred uh, from North Korea. And just within seconds, there, there's a young Spec 4, and he's telling you, it's going here. We've got this link. We know exactly where it's going. Don't need to engage. But if we did, here's a system we would use. And it's just linked together in an incredible manner, and it's really... Uh, when you think about it, it's a small example of where we need to go with multi-domain operations. You know, THAAD, Patriot, Aegis, either ashore or uh, at sea, none of them were designed to work together. Uh, Tippy 2 radars, the x none of them were designed to, to, you know, built to work together. Yet tremendous, and in this case, as I dug into it, warrant officers, uh, tremendous warrant officers, uh, smart, like you can't imagine, pulled these systems together so they are seamless, of course, using things like older technology like Link 16, et cetera. Uh, but it's absolutely amazing now, really, within seconds, they can tell what's going to happen, and they're out there defending us. Uh, and again, uh, at that point where we were getting missiles launched at a frequency like never before seen in history, uh, we all slept a lot better with the Thad and Patriot out there and the great teamwork of uh, Aegis cruisers roaming around as well, I would mention. So they're absolute heroes, and, uh, and no, no question uh, that we have the capability we need right now. However, I'm very glad that one of our modernization priorities, and Jim touched on it, I really applaud the Army's efforts. Army Futures Command, brilliant idea. Having uh, been in TRADOC a couple times, commanded the Maneuver Center and at CAC, I can tell you that it was very, very difficult to try to move a new program forward. You're, you're getting 80, 90 people together, all with different interests, trying to move in the same direction. Uh, what I see in Army's future, Army Futures Command, uh, very, very promising uh, that we'll be able to cut through a lot of that and get the capabilities we need much quicker. Not to mention uh, the brilliant idea of modernization priorities, kind of like if you look back, like the big five, only the the big six now, and cross-functional teams, pulling those individuals together uh, into a team is fantastic. And for example, I'm the uh, senior mentor, which means I'm an old son of a gun, uh, for the uh, long-range precision fires. And that's fantastic, being an infantryman. I ask them all kinds of questions, uh, get involved, and then obviously having, uh, it's, it's key uh, within our region, any region, but I would say Indo-Pacific, with a tyranny of distance and, uh, and again, the uh, incredible hyper-competition uh, nowhere more than there. So uh, tremendous teamwork in this. So it's really encouraging to me, and I'll talk some of the challenges that we're, we're working, and Jim touched on a bunch of them. Uh, but really, when you look at, again, in the Indo-Pacific, the ranges, the distances 
are, is an incredible challenge. The tyranny of distance is alive and well. It's kind of amazing. Sometimes you think modern technology has eliminated a lot of that. But when you look, like uh, during the Korean War, a ship sailing from the West Coast, it, it would take about 28 days. Uh, today, it takes about 27 days. <laughs> you know? and so you go, holy smokes, where's the technology here? You know, it's still this tyranny of distance is out there alive and well. Aircraft get there faster. However, we don't have as many. So we have challenges, and, uh, and, and uh, obviously uh, that, that is a huge, huge factor. You know, uh, our adversaries, uh, and, and I think former Secretary of Defense Mattis said it best, we had a period of a strategic atrophy where we were involved in two wars. I mean, you can't nobody you know, point fingers uh, where the priority should be the wars you're in, the combat. But we did, uh, during that period, our adversaries have uh, moved out in hypersonics, lasers, railgun technology, uh, drones, holy smoke, you want to talk about an area Jim touched on, but how about drone swarms and some of these challenges that are out there, and you buy a drone for a couple hundred bucks, uh, and as we've seen, there's folks even arming those and what you can do. So when I look at uh, integrated air and missile defense in the future, the forward presence is key. They've got to be there. Uh, they've got to be in the region, obviously. That's a no-brainer. And I see it It's uh, you know, smaller footprints becoming the norm. Uh, not large footprints, not a neon sign, here's where we're at, come mess with us, but more mobility, smaller footprints, things like remote launch kind of becoming the norm, uh, where you have that capability to remote launch, and smaller radars, and, uh, and I would also mention uh, something that we have been tremendous at as a nation, uh, really coming back, and we've got to really get back at it, is denial and deception. I mean, think about, if you go back, Patton's Army, for example, uh, just incredible. As you look at denial and deception over the years, even Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the Marines, that deception, the left hook, and the things that worked out, you can go to every conflict. We have kind of lost that a little bit, but we are going to need that uh, in a different type. It's not so much, yes, you're going to try to hide some stuff, but that's pretty tough today. Well, there's some technologies to help you, but it's pretty tough. Uh, you can uh, Google Earth a satellite shot and uh, pretty tough to hide stuff and hide emissions and so forth. But it's more a, uh, what we're finding uh, in our efforts in multi-domain ops, it's more of a saturation. Uh, for example, if you had uh, a device the size of a, uh, that water bottle right there that emits a tippy-2 radar signal and there are 10,000 of them out there, well, good luck finding the actual tippy-2 and waste a lot of time looking for that needle in the haystack. That's more the direction uh, and denial and deception. That'll be key in uh, air and missile defense because you're, 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 uh, you can't be a sitting duck. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, increased mobility. You know, I'm excited about uh, IFPIC. You know, it's been around, but I, I think we're really moving forward. I'm excited about IBCS and what that's going to do to pull systems together. I think it's really smart, as Jim mentioned. I would call it a layered defense that we have to have, you know, and, a, and layers like never before. We kind of had shore ad before and then the missile. Well, now you've got you know, everything from the cruise missile threat to uh, hypersonic uh, and, and uh, all the, so th this layers, more layers than ever, uh, more mobile than ever, but working seamlessly together still, and that, that is absolutely critical, uh, that layered defense. When I look at SHORAD in particular, I'm really excited, uh, M SHORAD, and I'm very glad, I think the Iron Dome was a tremendous decision, and, and again, we can use all of that as critical as you're looking at layered, that short range air defense, and, uh, you know, lasers have tremendous potential. And I was particularly excited uh, having done the test and evaluation on the striker vehicle and uh, had uh, one of the first striker brigades to see the lasers on strikers, I think, is a great idea as well because that mobility you get, uh, there's some great potential there. You know, we also are looking as we've uh, kind of submitted, uh, hey, help us out with a dual purpose artillery as you're looking at high velocity projectiles. What about artillery that can do artillery and potentially an air defense role against some targets, be it a, uh, a cruise missile. Uh, but that, that gives you incredible potential, and these are some of the things we're looking at as we look at uh, future systems, no doubt, in uh, IAMD. Now, joint integration, I think, though, is the absolute key. And Pat Donahue over there, he's thinking, you know, when we were together in TRADOC, we were talking, you know, we have joint interdependence now. We have gaps where we depend on the other services, and we're incredibly joint more joint than anybody else in the world, I would say, uh, but we're not joint enough. And it's got to move from interdependence to integration. And uh, I was fortunate enough to work with uh, like Dave Perkins, Pat, uh, HR, McMaster, on these concepts in the Army operating concept that have moved into multi-domain operations. 
And what we're seeing is that, you know, episodically we can pull together capabilities, but it takes weeks, sometimes months. It's got to move from episodic to routine, minutes and hours, where it's absolutely routine. And, and uh, air and missile defense is a key part of that space as well, as I'll talk about. And when you look at, you know, what commander doesn't want more options? And I can tell you my uh, uh, boss in the war fight is a combatant commander, and it's pretty exciting right now as we're seeing more options in the Pacific. Of course, we've always had the theater enabling command role, the joint foundation the Army has as a uh, Army Service Component Command. No other service, for example, has 94th AAMDC, a general officer air and missile defense command. No other service has a two-star logistics command, a one-star uh, strategic communications for the theater, uh, regional health command for the theater, Corps of Engineers with a general officer. You know, these things are unique. Army provides that foundation to the joint force and they have a significant role in theater joint force land component commander in setting the theater. But also now what we're seeing change uh, with multi-domain operations is, you know, where we had domination, as I mentioned earlier, in the air, maritime, we don't in any domain for long periods. We can for short periods, and, and uh, Jim showed you some of that up there in convergence, which is a concept that's moving rapidly to doctrine. So what commander doesn't want more options? And I can tell you the Indo-PACOM commander wants more options. And so, for example, right now we're going through uh, uh, the first ever uh, combined joint task force certification for a four-star land command in the Pacific. It has always only been maritime four-star. Now, three-star, we certify. I certified as First Corps Commander. Gary Valesky does as First Corps Commander. But now, first time ever, land four-star JTF certification. Ongoing right now. Almost had to VTC into this because we had some academics going this week, but we push it to next week, and uh, June will be a busy month going through a Joint Task Force certification. Why is that? Well, uh, things are changing, and as I mentioned, uh, we don't have dominance in any one domain. And so uh, as we look, we've got to work even closer together in that joint integration like never before in multi-domain operations. And land has a significant role. I often look at history. When you look, uh, go back to uh, uh, World War II, it kind of amazes people. Six corps were in the Pacific and 22 divisions, both way more than we have today, uh, just in the Pacific. And it's interesting, in World War II, as you look and you study it, Air and maritime were enabling land, uh, where the Army did over 300 amphibious operations, by the way. Eighth Army was known as the Amphib-8. Uh, they did continual amph amphibious operations. Uh, but air and maritime enabled the land to seize the land, leapfrog uh, island to island, and, and gain the airfields, et cetera. I would tell you today what we're seeing is land enabling air and maritime because of the massive A2AD threat uh, the Air Force and Navy cannot get in the first island chain without land. Uh, and what we're also seeing, uh, some incredible advantages on land, as I mentioned. And I want to show a, uh, a short video uh, to just show some of the uh, where we're going with multi-domain ops. Uh, Blake, if you can play that video back there, I think this would be good. Just give you a little background on it. The U.S. military is evolving to ensure it's ready to fight in this new environment. Its new doctrine, multi-domain operations, recognizes that future conflict must be met with seamless integration across the joint team. And it will not just occur on land, sea, and in the air, but it will include the space domain and cyber domain as well. It's an evolutionary process. Over time, we've had air, land, air, land, sea. We're evolving, but it's a revolutionary impact where you're maneuvering in all domains to a position of relative advantage, maneuvering in cyber to a position of relative advantage pre-conflict, maneuvering in, in space to a position of relative advantage. A missile launched from the land can uh, destroy a ship at sea controlled by an army element, but using Navy, Air Force, Marine, some national satellite means things never before used to pull it together. Now picture of that ship is trying to skirt into the littorals to avoid our strength at sea that our Navy, the best in the world, has. So they're, they're trying to skirt around it. Well, the Army can engage that ship now and destroy it. So now it has to go back out to sea and be right in our 
uh, engagement area where we're going to destroy them. So you're pairing up together all domains, maneuvering to a position of relative advantage in each domain, working together to create those windows of opportunity uh, where you can dominate your adversary. That gives you more options against an adversary. Anybody would want more options. It allows you to present multiple dilemmas to an adversary. And we're either going to do like we are now, innovate and move towards multi-domain operations uh, to either win a conflict in the future or prevent it because uh, nobody would be stupid enough to fight against us, or we're going to be forced to do it because we lose someday pretty badly and we're going to have to do it, and I hope that's not the case. For the last several years, the Army has been leading this doctrinal evolution by piloting a multi-domain task force designed to enable the joint team. This is a tailorable, scalable unit which can be deployed by the combatant commander to synchronize and synergize joint capabilities. At its heart is the I2Q's detachment, intelligence, information, electronic warfare, and space. This element is comprised of four companies and can effectively penetrate an adversary's anti-access area denial shield, shape conditions in all domains, and open windows of opportunity for Navy, Air Force, Army, and Marine maneuver. Based on requirements, other capabilities can be snap-linked into the I2Qs. Long-range precision fires, security forces, logistics, air defense artillery, aviation, and engineers, making this a highly lethal, maneuverable organization. In exercises, the task force has demonstrated that it can enable Navy and Air Force maneuver in restricted terrain, create multiple options for the Joint Commander by coordinating targeting data and fires for all services and in all domains, and create multiple dilemmas for an adversary. Additionally, using denial and deception, the task force can camouflage its operations and confuse enemy sensors. It is a mobile and maneuverable organization. Nobody wants to fight. You know, the best thing would be, again, the deterrence where we never have to fight because nobody would be foolish enough uh, to go against us. So that, that's the best thing. So we've got a lot to connect, a lot of work to do, uh, pull all the pieces together. But if anybody can do it, uh, the United States military can. I feel very confident, and I'm very proud of the United States Army leading the way with multi-domain operations. So uh, some of the advantages on land that we're finding in this two years through a series of tabletops, uh, uh, exercises, uh, simulations, uh, persistent coverage. I mean, think about it. Yes, you can cover from air and at sea, but persistent coverage on land, uh, really survivability, which kind of surprised. We saw the even uh, Office of Net Assessments recently did a war game. One of the conclusions, multi-domain ops works. And, uh, and then also uh, the fact that uh, land is the most survivable. Uh, and it's, it makes sense when you think about it. Uh, you know, obviously, you could survive in an area at sea, but it's kind of hard to, uh, to hide. Uh, and the same reason, why is it uh, so difficult on the land as we look at challenges? Oh, you can blend into populations. You have things like uh, caves, mountains, valleys, jungles. Uh, the land is difficult. Same reason it's sometimes hard to communicate on land uh, because of those challenges, the terrain challenges. I mentioned earlier, you know, nothing says resolve like uh, land as well, you know, boots on the ground. And then magazine depth. I mean, you can have almost unlimited if you do it right uh, and, you, and you really uh, set the theater properly. You got better magazine depth uh, for sure, no doubt about it. I do want to touch on space because absolutely you couldn't talk uh, air and missile defense. You can't talk multi-domain operations without space. Space, I would say space and cyber, as you saw there, uh, are two of the... Uh, uh, I would say newer domains, but also the ones that offer the most promise, but also the greatest challenges, uh, incredible challenges because of authorities, policies. Uh, and so uh, they're absolutely key as you look at this. And, and uh, you saw with, with space, you know, uh, we had incredible advantages in space, and our adversaries saw that over the last 10, 15 years. And so what have they done? They've really worked uh, to, to negate that advantage and, and develop their own systems, an area they believe is a weakness for us. So if you look at China, for example, in the year 2000, had roughly 25 satellites, uh, over 300 now in space. Uh, unbelievable. And then Chinese and Russian military doctrine talks about uh, counter space capabilities to defeat the U.S. systems. And when you look, uh, they're developing, obviously, jamming, cyberspace capabilities, directed energy weapons, on-orbit capabilities, they've got uh, ground-based satellite missiles, 
Uh, and some, are, some of these things are reversible to non-reversible, what they can do in space. And you heard Jim talk about our reliance, the Army ground relies on space for so many things, PNT, GPS, you name it, uh, communications, et cetera. So it has a significant impact on uh, integrated air missile defense, obviously. So we've got to, another reason I'm glad we're investing and working in this area, uh, because you can't, if we sit back, we're going to lose that advantage. Uh, we've got to invest as we move forward. Uh, and the good news is, uh, as you saw, talked about, we're, we're, we're really seeing incredible efforts uh, in integrating in a joint manner and um, enabling the ability to provide multiple dilemmas to an adversary which you've got to do. We can't be so linear and predictable, but provide, provide them, uh, present them with multiple dilemmas they have to deal with. Uh, and, uh, and we can do that, and there's a couple reasons. Uh, and one, again, is the quality of a huge advantage to us, the quality of our people, and our very philosophy of mission command empowerment. And probably the most promising in this multi-domain ops is, as you saw mentioned, a multi-domain task force. And this is a maneuver formation that again, has its brains as the I2Qs. And this is something was a concept uh, really about a year, year and a half ago, and has moved right into doctrine where one month ago at uh, Joint Base lewis McCord and First Corps, we stood up the first I2Qs battalion, intelligence, information, cyber, electronic warfare, and space. Forward in the region so you can compete. This is the key thing. Uh, you know, when you're not in the region, you're kind of playing what I would say like that carnival game, whack-a-mole. Something comes up, you, you hit it. Something comes up again, you're hitting it. There's no – but when you're forward and present, and the I2Qs will do that, we'll actually have uh, this year, first time ever in history, a multi-domain task force in the Pacific, on the Pacific Pathways, for a major exercise, uh, Orient Shield. Uh, and they'll be working closely uh, with Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force and demonstrating capabilities never before seen. Uh, and it'll be linked in, by the way, to uh, dynamic force employment uh, and efforts from uh, all of Indo-PACOM, uh, major exercise, uh, again, where you're getting that persistence and being in the theater competing, not uh, there, uh, again, in a, a strategy. It'd be more like you're, you're in and out and you can't compete. There's things you can do in domains when you're there uh, in the pre-conflict, in the competition phase, in the crisis phase, and uh, if they don't prevent it, God forbid you move to the conflict phase, things you can do that make a huge difference, particularly in space and cyber. So uh, there's an incredible cross-domain synergy, and I'm not going to go into uh, all the uh, uh, details, but I will just say that, you know, when you look at Airland Battle, it took 14 years, and some of us were company troop battery commanders back when that was coming about. We learned an air land battle to fight outnumbered and win, and the big five came about and changes in training, education. Well, uh, that's what we're going through now, but unfortunately we don't have 14 years. We've got to move from concept to doctrine much faster, and we're seeing that in the concept, spin off into the multi-domain task force very quickly, uh, I2Qs, and then another area, convergence, uh, that Jim mentioned earlier where you're maneuvering in all domains to a position of relative advantage to create an opening. Uh, and we're doing this just recently. First Corps did this, for example, an exercise in Japan uh, back in December. Uh, and they maneuvered to a position of advantage uh, to identify uh, enemy uh, radar systems that they lit up and then maneuvered in another domain uh, to get in position to defeat those and then maneuvered in another domain uh, to then uh, exploit that opening in the A2AD umbrella. Uh, and what we're finding is you almost create in this multi-domain task force, you have your own uh, miniature A2AD, uh, again, more mobile, but definitely a key for us in the Pacific out there in the first uh, island chain for certain. So uh, really exciting as we uh, rapidly move forward and capturing all this again, as I said. And, and then the one thing I do not want to forget, another one of our key advantages is our allies and partners. In the Indo-Pacific, we have five of our seven allies in the world are in the Indo-Pacific. Five of seven, with Japan, Korea, Thailand, Philippines, and Australia, uh, and, and uh, incredible alliances, rock solid, made even more solid with uh, uh, tensions with North Korea that were going on over the last two, three years, and never seen in my 30 plus years in the Pacific region, never seen stronger alliances. And what this does for us, maybe some of these folks can't 
do exactly like we're doing in multi-domain ops. It's pretty complex stuff. But what portion of it can they do? Uh, they've got AH-64 Echoes, for example, that say, you know, uh, Indonesia, and they're on the, the border of the South China Sea. That can do some stuff. Japan, in some cases, has assets we don't have, like SSM-12, uh, land-based anti-ship missile. And so what assets do your allies have and your partners? It gives you really that 10x, because the good news is uh, those com we're competing against don't have alliances and partnerships like we do. So it gives you that, that incredible. So foreign military sales, very important. Building allies, partners, and relationships, extremely important. I spend uh, well over half my time doing that in the region, and we do it in exercises, training. We're there involved, and you're building that relationships and strengthening it. And that's a key to success, no doubt about it. Really give it a 10x leap when you get your allies and partners involved. It's huge. So um, thank goodness we've got the integrated air and missile defense we do today. Uh, the character of war has changed and continues. It's not going to slow down. I think some of the, uh, those of us have uh, been around a long time, you keep thinking, boy, when will it go back to, uh, no, nope, it's only speeding up you know, velocity of human interaction. And that changes things again, to a hyper-competition. You've got to be out there. You've got to have the presence. You've got to, we've got to modernize uh, and make up for that period of strategic atrophy. And thank goodness the Army is doing that in a smart manner with priorities, uh, with uh, trying to work uh, all those challenges with Army Futures Command uh, to help. And then very quickly, this promising multi-domain ops, capturing what's working and turning it uh, from a concept which in some cases is, you know, concepts to be tr proven wrong in some cases, and where it works, it rolls into doctrine. And we're already seeing uh, the plans changing, uh, where some cases the Army wasn't involved, now we're central uh, and key, as I mentioned, even certifying as a four-star JTF land headquarters for the first time ever in the Pacific because of the changing roles uh, and how we have to work together in a joint manner. So uh, thanks for having me. I really... Uh, uh, Again, another incredible understatement, uh, integrated air and missile defense and space are key to this effort, uh, more so than I would have ever thought, I will tell you. And uh, I look forward, I think we have a few minutes for, uh, 15 minutes for questions. So uh, throw the tough ones up this way and uh, I'll build some of my classmates out there, no tough questions. You know, come on in there, I see they're, uh, they're salivating. All right. Sir, I'll kick things off with a, a question that we got from the audience. Uh, Japan, as you know, is being considered as a potential location for the Homeland Defense Radar, HDR. Yeah. Why might Japan be a good location for the HDR? And how is the HDR different from the two AN TP2 radars already in Japan? Well, I'll throw the, uh, the tech technology piece to my, uh, to my brothers uh, who do this for a living. But I will say we definitely need the radars and we need uh, increased. I, I, I don't know, uh, I would leave it to the experts of where it's best positioned, but I will tell you we need the, uh, we, we need the radars. And there's also a possibility of Hawaii positioning in Hawaii and there, there are some gaps, but I would leave it to the experts of where. I do know we need additional radars and we need additional capability. Um, and I also know, uh, you know, I'm very happy with the uh, Tippy 2 uh, but any system can be improved, and it's got limitations uh, uh, that, that we work, and, uh, you know, the way we employ it, we try to negate some of those limitations, but there's always room for improvement there. I don't know, uh, Jim, on any of the technical stuff on that, you want to comment on that, or is that the difference in the radars that was asked? That's way out of my league. <laughs> I, I, I would just add on, reiterate, uh, kind of reemphasize what General Brown said. You know, so <clears throat> you know, geometry is everything when you're looking at radars. Uh, I don't know if there's been a final decision made, sir, on, on where where it exactly will go. But uh, when you look at, uh, we talked about the growing threat. Uh, we talked about increasing capacities, uh, and so when you look at how are we how are we are able to process that information, you you need more than a, just a couple of sensors to do that. So. Uh, I think uh, bringing newer technology on board is very important, and I think these efforts that MDA, Missile Defense Agency, is looking at right now are very critical for that fight. As uh, <clears throat> General uh, Brown mentioned, you know, it's the tyranny of distance out there. So uh, I think it's going to be a combination not only of a ground-based capability, but I think we're going to see space-based capabilities as well in terms of developing a space sensor layer 
uh, with the idea that you've got to have a capability to to uh, observe from launch to whatever the ultimate demise right of that interceptor is. So we've got to be able to see it before it launches, uh, see it early in the launch, and see it through all phases of flight. And you do that by having more than just a couple of sensors that are particularly looking at it. And I will add to that, uh, in multi-domain ops and all the uh, efforts we've been doing, this won't surprise you one bit, uh, obviously, uh, as our weapons ranges increase, the challenge are the sensors to observe them at great distances. So there are some pretty clever things uh, being developed uh, using satellites and other means. And then also there's some radars uh, some of the other services have that are very helpful, over-the-horizon radars uh, that are extremely useful. So if you think of, uh, I think one of the things we're learning, uh, system agnostic and platform agnostic, tying stuff together. Who cares if it's a F-35 that observes it and passes it back uh, for a, a, a U.S. field artillery system to engage it, or if it's a special ops system. That, you know, the more interaction with those sensors and platforms, the better in that kill chain web, and that says we're working through that. Eyes deep is really critical. Uh, and obviously, with air and missile defense, being able to early warning, the earlier warning, the better. That's a no-brainer. Uh, so obviously, you're going to want those radars as good as you can get uh, farther forward, and we're really working and looking, working with the other services where they have some great capabilities and great potential. Question, yeah, J.D. Hey, General Brown, he, uh, I was really intrigued by the discussion of uh, multi-domain operations and how the partners fit into that. With respect to air and missile defense, your thoughts on how, you know, because we're out there in industry working with these same partners, mm -hmm. talking about their capabilities, how do you see us collaborating, if you will, yeah. to, to make sure we're feeding that process. No, that's, a great, that's a great question, J.D. And I think what I've seen is, uh, I'll be honest, at first I kind of looked, and I was like, you know, those allies and partners that can do a lot, that's who we're with. Uh, so, you know, they have systems, uh, you know, uh, uh, ones uh, we, we all know, you know, Japan has great capabilities, Australia. But then you kind of look at some of the other partners, emerging partners, even allies, and you say, well, they don't have a lot of capabilities, so do we spend a lot of time? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, th that's key. They don't have to have the whole suite and complement like we may do, but por portions of it are critical. And what they can do in presenting those multiple dilemmas to an enemy, if you think about uh, much better in any scenario, we're not going to do anything alone. We'd be crazy to do anything alone. So uh, allies and partners are key, and they present a lot of dilemmas. You know, when you just take a look, China, for example, will do some operations with other nations. They're mostly HADR, and if they're anything but that, they're really simple, basic, where we are doing advanced level like I have never seen with our allies and partners, and looking at what strengths they have. So I think for industry, it shouldn't be, well, that maybe they're not going to buy this whole suite. What will they buy that will you know, contribute? And they're all interested. They may want portions of air defense. They may want portions. They want, may want to be able to stop hypersonic. They may be working uh, drones, counter drones. Any of those capabilities they have are huge when you pull them together, allies and partners. That's a, you know, I call it the 10x effect and gives you that advantage that uh, those who would do you harm don't have. And by the way, that's great for deterrence. Nobody wants to fight, and if you have that advantage, you deter those that may do you harm, and then you don't have to fight, which is uh, ultimately what happened. We won the Cold War. We're all very proud, you know, we deterred, we never had to fight the Soviets, thank God, and that's a, that's a way to go after it. And if we do that smart with our allies and what capabilities they do need, may not be the whole thing, but what portion can they afford, can they, uh, you know, work closely with us and integrate, uh, that'll be a game changer. Sir, Dan Roper with AUSA. Uh, any sense or any shooter sounds good it's a great aspirational goal, but what's the multi-domain task force learning about fire support coordination measures, airspace deconfliction, yeah. and deconfliction of fires? Yeah, absolutely. This is, the, uh, this is what Admiral Davidson hits me up with all the time, uh, whereas we're connecting and learning and, and connecting more and more, he goes back to who has the authorities. I want to know who is saying launch this because that, that becomes a tough thing. It's kind of like with mission command. The tough part of mission command is not the empowerment. You know, you have that kind of, you build trust, you talk prudent risk. The tough part of mission command is when something goes wrong, right? Where does the buck stop? And we've seen things go wrong in a platoon and a three-star is really, you know, and where, where does the buck stop? 
we're still kind of sorting through that. You have to empower. We know that for sure. It's very similar with authorities. Uh, what we're doing, don't let, well, I think what we did in the past, uh, wrong, uh, wrongly, was we let the authorities slow us down. And it was almost an excuse. Well, we can't do that because I don't have authorities in cyber for that, offensive cyber. Well, have we asked? Can we show? And what we're seeing as we're doing these TTXs and exercise and simulations, we're able to show if we have this authority, this policy is modified, we can do this, which made us much more successful. And then guess what? They're giving us that authority. So we've got to push it. But in some cases, we don't know what we don't know as we're combining and connecting all this. Uh, but all the services are working closely together. And we've got to keep pushing forward. We've got to use the exercises, uh, tabletop simulations, war games, and all of us are doing that and working that. Uh, and no question, multi-domain ops is the most promising of all these. But we can't let it slow us down. We've got to sort it out. But it is not easy. It's the hardest part. But again, I think what we've done in the past is just say, well, we can't do that. Uh, and, uh, and that's wrong. You've got to really work through it, sort it out. Some authorities will get some we won't. But we'll figure it out, just like we have in the past, uh, but not if we allow ourselves to be held back. We've got to push it and, and figure out the solutions. Sir, another question from the audience. Uh, as you know, in order for multi-domain operations to work, you must have Air Force and Navy to support. How repetitive are they, and how are you involving them? Uh, what did, you said how uh, involving them right before that. How, how repetitive, repetitive are they? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, that's been uh, incredibly refreshing. Uh, for example, uh, RIMPAC exercise. You know, three years ago, we asked the Navy, uh, went to PAC Fleet and, of course, Indo-PACOM, but PAC Fleet, and said, look, we'd like to turn the largest maritime exercise in the world into the largest multi-domain exercise in the world. I thought they'd tell us to pound sand, this is our exercise, forget it. Just the opposite. They opened it up to us right from the beginning, from the initial planning conference, and it became the largest multi-domain exercise two years later. It takes coordination work, and, and they get it. The, the thing that has helped, none of us can do it alone. I think before, quite honestly, in the Pacific, for example, uh, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, depends on where you want to draw, the Air Force and Navy probably could handle some of those scenarios, South China Sea, East China Sea scenario, without needing too much help from other services. Of course, you'd always want to be joint. But they could, they could, and now they can't. They just can't, and they know that. And so it's forcing us to work together. Now, uh, we do, though, you know, some days I, I kind of think, man, do we need a Goldwater Nichols II that forces us, everything developed can talk to every other service, and it kind of forces us to truly integrate in a joint manner. Some days I get frustrated. Other days I'm feeling pretty good. I think we're going to get there. It's not easy. We all grow up in service stovepipes. And, and it causes things like I'm almost embarrassed that I ever did Army to Army only exercise in the Pacific. Why would we do that? We never fight like that. I mean, maybe there's some things you work on Army to Army only, but why wouldn't you always have at least some joint aspect, even if it's simulation? Because that's how you're going to fight. A joint, multi The future is multilateral. Uh, and the Pacific used to be very bilateral, and everybody said it'll never be multilateral. It's multilateral uh, in a major way. And I don't think it'll ever be a NATO-like structure but it is multilateral. So the other services have been superb working together. And the other key factor, we're very fortunate we had Admiral Harris as Indo-PACOM commander who really pushed us in that direction. Admiral Davidson has come in uh, and pushed us even more. Everything we do, he's like, "Where? hey, where's the uh, Air Force in this? Where's the Army in this? It, it can be anything we do because he realizes we have to do that. He wants more options. What combatant commander wouldn't want more options? What combatant commander wouldn't want to present more dilemmas to your enemy. Of course you do. So he realizes that. But it is, uh, I'm not going to say it's easy and uh, we get stuck in service stovepipes sometimes. And I do worry, you know, when the money's good, it's easier. If the money gets tight, all of a sudden people go back in corners and, you know, how it is sequestration, it was really rough to work together because everybody's fighting just to be able to do what you need to do in your own service. So uh, uh, that is a factor as well. Sir, it's Robert Taylor, General Atomics. So we heard about the variety of the threat, uh, uh, and in the Cold War we worried about 45,000 tanks. Uh, I haven't heard much. Uh, maybe perhaps you can speak to the need to afford to deal with swarms, uh, multiple uh, threats, uh, uh, not, just, not just a variety. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, I think that's where technology is going to be. I see a lot of potential with laser uh, lasers with that. I mean, there's a certain counter IED system, uh, counter IED, counter UAS systems we have now that are very good. I've got uh, you know several systems uh, out there now with uh, working with THAAD and uh, and other systems, uh, and it's a growing threat. Uh, UAS, as was mentioned, uh, with swarms. I think the laser. That's why I think uh, you know there are you There's no one right solution and one panacea, but laser seems very uh, promising for that. But there's other. You want you want multiple methods. So uh, I think drone swarms will continue to be an issue. Uh, I also think uh, we're, we're starting to see ways we can use them effectively, particularly in uh, mega cities, which, by the way, we have uh, you know m more than over half in the world are in the Pacific. So dealing with mega cities and drone swarms can help us quite a bit. But uh, in, in defenses against them, I do believe there's several uh, a combination of systems we have now. Uh, that get at the electronics and so forth, and then a combination of lasers. And then also, what I mentioned earlier will be key, denial and deception. Denial and deception will be absolutely critical, and that can be perhaps the best thing, best defense. Uh, let the drone swarms go where they think we are and we're not there, and they waste that capability. That's the best uh, defense you could have, and that's a key thing we're working on and finding a tremendous potential. So uh, yeah, thanks. So, hey, hey, thanks for the questions. I can stay here all morning. This is... Uh, very exciting and uh, really appreciate it. But I also want to thank you, uh, you know, again, all of you in here. I've seen a bunch of you helping us uh, with this new technology and new equipment. Again, that's a huge advantage we have, uh, all of you working to help us have the best and get the best equipment in our soldiers' hands. And they'll amaze us with what they do. There's no doubt about it. Our people are our main advantage. And then those great allies we have and partners uh, it, it, it's going to make a huge difference. So thanks for all you're doing to get the best out there for them. It makes a huge difference, and we appreciate. And I'm very excited about the future, as I said, with uh, the priority modernization and so forth and the effort uh, in uh, the future in multi-domain ops. Uh, we're heading in the right direction. So thanks for the opportunity.